Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today we will talk about the causes of oligohydramnios. Oligohydramnios is a condition in which there is decreased amount of amniotic fluid or lycor around the baby. Quantitatively on ultrasound, oligohydramnios may be defined as the maximum vertical pool of less than 2 cm or an amniotic fluid index of less than 5 cm or an AFI below 5th centile for the gestational age. There are many causes of oligohydramnios which, we'll, which we will discuss today but first of all I would recommend you to subscribe this channel and press the bell icon. In order to study oligohydramnios as a case follow the links given in the i button on the top right corner of this video which will take you to the playlist of oligohydramnios. So first of all we will discuss the main causes of oligohydramnios. What are the eight main causes of oligohydramnios? Here we have a complete list. So first cause is that of the maternal diseases. Secondly, pregnancy complication. Thirdly, fetal complications. Four, structural causes. Five, utero-placenta insufficiency. Six, infectious causes. Seven, iatrogenic causes. And eight is that of idiopathic so what are the maternal diseases which cause oligohydramnios here we have a list of four main maternal causes four main maternal conditions and diseases which are responsible for decreased amount of lycor around the baby first is that of the hypertension means increased blood pressure secondly the chronic kidney diseases of the mother Third, diabetes insipidus, and then maternal dehydration. Now, which pregnancy complications cause the oligohydramnios? Here we have a list of three, met three pregnancy complications which are responsible for decreased amount of lycor. First of all, spontaneous rupture of membranes. Secondly, preterm premature rupture of membranes and the post-state pregnancy means more than 42 weeks of gestation. Now, what fetal complications cause the oligohydramnios? Basically, we have two main fetal complications which are responsible for oligohydramnios. First is that of the intrauterine growth retardation. Secondly, twin to twin transfusion syndrome TTTS. Now, what structural causes of the fetus are responsible for oligohydramnios? Here we have a list of the structural problems in the fetus which are responsible for oligohydramnios. And that include first of all bilateral renal agenesis or dysplasia which occur for example in the case of Porter syndrome. Here we have the Porter syndrome. Secondly, urethral obstruction is also responsible for oligohydramnios. Then the cystic dysplasia, then a syndrome called the Mackel gruber syndrome and the Vactral syndrome which is basically a combination of the different uh, anomalies in the fetus that include the vertebral anomalies, the anal atresia, cardiovascular anomalies, the tracheoesophageal fistula, esophageal atresia, renal or radial anomalies and the limb defects. Now let us discuss the utero placental insufficiency which results from certain conditions like diabetes, drug abuse, post-state pregnancy, certain cardiac conditions like high blood pressure, medical conditions that may cause the blood clot or in the cases where there are, there are developmental issues with the placenta. This utero placental insufficiency results in the decreased amount of lycor. Now coming to the infectious causes of oligohyramnios. Certain congenital viral infections can also result in oligohydramnia. The most common among all is that of the CMV or cytomegalovirus. Coming to the iatrogenic cause of oligohydramnios, certain drugs are responsible for the decreased amount of lycor. Here we have a list. So first of all, ACE inhibitor means angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors like enalapril, lisinopril, captopril, etc. 
Other drugs which are responsible for oligohedramnios include the prostaglandin synthase inhibitors like indomethacin and ibuprofen, etc. Coming to the idiopathic cause of oligohedramnios, a specific percentage of uh, oligohedramnios is of no specific etiology. The medical term idiopathic comes from the Greek root idios or one's own and pathos means suffering or disease. So the literal meaning is something like a disease of its own or an illness that isn't connected to any particular cause. So idiopathic oligohedramnios means reduced emotiflaca due to unknown cause. Let us explain the complete list of oligohedramnios, which include first of all the maternal diseases, hypertension, chronic kidney diseases, diabetes, insipidus, maternal dehydration. Secondly, pregnancy complications, which include spontaneous rupture of membranes, preterm premature rupture of membranes, the post-date pregnancy of more than 42 weeks. Then we may have certain fetal complications, which include the IOGR and TTTS. Certain structural causes, which include the bilateral renal agenesis or dysplasia, urethral obstruction, cystic dysplasia, Meckel-Gruber syndrome, and Vectral syndrome. Then we may have the placenta insufficiency or the infectious causes, which include the congenital viral infections like CMV, or we may have iatrogenic causes like ACE inhibitors or the prostaglandin synthase inhibitors like indomethacin and ibuprofen, etc. In the end, we may have certain idiopathic causes as well. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Now we will discuss the pathophysiology of oligohydramnios. Amniotic fluid is formed by a specific mechanism in pregnancy. First, I will explain how amniotic fluid is formed normally and then one by one I will clarify how the, the different causes of oligohydramnios which we discussed before reduce the amount of lycra around the baby. In the top right corner of this video, you can find the complete list of videos related to oligohydramnios. So, how amniotic fluid is uh, produced normally? In the first half of pregnancy, amniotic fluid is derived from fetal and possibly maternal compartment by diffusion of water and salute. Okay, so remember this important point. First half of pregnancy, diffusion of water and salute. Basically, the water and salute freely traverse the fetal skin and may diffuse through the amnion and chorion as well. And this amniotic fluid in the early gestation is a uh, dialysate that is identical to the fetal and maternal plasma but with a lower protein concentration would happen in the second half of the pregnancy uh, by the second trimester the fetal skin becomes keratinized making it uh, impermeable to further diffusion at this time fetus contributes to the amniotic fluid volume and composition almost exclusively through the fetal urination and urine has been observed in the fetal bladder as early as 11 weeks uh, transabdominally and 9 weeks transvaginally. So this is how the amniotic fluid is produced in the first half by diffusion of water and solutes and in the second half by fetal urination. And the in input uh, into amniotic fluid is from the fetal urine and lungs fluid and output is from the amniotic fluid uh, which include the fetal solving and intramembranous flow to the placenta and to the fetus as you can see here in this picture. Now we will explain how the maternal diseases cause oligohydramnios. First of all, hypertension. Maternal hypertension causes placental insufficiency and uh, poor perfusion of water and cellulose through the amnion and chorion. And this fetus has the diminished uh, urine output resulting in decreased amount of lycra. This is how the oligohydramnios take place in the hypertension. So what happens in the chronic kidney disease? Chronic kidney disease uh, may cause impaired glycolytic uh, integrity and alteration in the complement and renin angiotensin aldosterone system in the kidney, thereby increasing the risk of preeclampsia and high blood pressure, which in turn decreases the uh, liquor volume as we discussed before. Uh, then what happens in diabetes insipidus? Diabetes insipidus causes oligohydramnios by maternal dehydration. And uh, why is there oligohydramnios in maternal dehydration? Basically, this dehydration causes the marked effect on the maternal fetal amniotic fluid dynamics by causing the poor perfusion of water and solutes through the amnion and chorion. And thus, the fetus has diminished urine output, possibly contributing to the development of oligohydramnios. 
Now we will explain how pregnancy complications cause oligohydramnias. First of all, spontaneous rupture of membrane. I don't need to explain why is there oligohydramnias in case of spontaneous rupture of membrane. The ruptured membrane will not let amniotic fluid volume to stay at an optimum level. And what happens in preterm premature rupture of membrane, there is a continuous leaking or prickling of amniotic fluid resulting in oligohydramnias. Now the post-date pregnancy. There are several theories, but some theories state that in post-term pregnancies, there is a redistribution of the blood flow due to increased um, fetal weight resulting in renal hypoperfusion and decreased urination that may cause the oligohydramnias. Now let us explain how fetal complications cause oligohydramnias like IUGR and DTTS. Uh, about 85% of IUGR infants have oligohydramnias and this condition occur because the blood flow from peripheral organs like kidneys uh, is diverted to the brain and renal perfusion and urinary flow rates are commonly reduced in infants with IUGR. An amniotic fluid index of less than 5 cm further increases the risk of IUGR. Now coming to TTTS, twin to twin transfusion syndrome. In TTTS, uh, there is a state of um, transfusion which causes the donor twin to have decreased blood flow, uh, retarding the donor's development and growth, and also a decreased urinary output, leading to lower than normal level of amniotic fluid, becoming oligohydramnios. Now we will explain how structural causes result in oligohydramnias. Uh, we discuss the different uh, structural causes first of all like bilateral renal agenesis uh, also called the dysplasia which happens in cases of Porter syndrome. So what happened in this case by the end of the second trimester or by the second trimester what happens that the fetal skin becomes keratinized making it uh, impermeable to further diffusion as I've explained before. Uh, at this time the fetus contributes to amniotic fluid volume and the composition almost exclusively through the fetal urination. But what happens in case of the renal agenesis, uh, what happens that there is the uh, urine production of the um, uh, fetus which is uh, diminished so uh, there is a reduced amount of lycor. What happens in urethral obstruction? The urethra is basically the tube that allows the bladder to empty into amniotic space, making it possible for the body's uh, urine to maintain the normal amniotic fluid level around the baby. Over the time, this blockage can cause the permanent uh, kidney damage and when the urine can no longer be drained, the fluid around the baby, um, also called the amniotic fluid, tends to decrease. And what happens in the cystic dysplasia, the same mechanism which I have explained in the renal agenesis is responsible for oligohydramnios in case of cystic dysplasia as well. Now what happens in the Meckel-Gruber syndrome? In Meckel-Gruber syndrome, there is the uh, classical uh, triad of uh, occipital encephalopathy, polycystic kidney and post-axial polydactyly. Cysts develop first in the glomeruli in the cortex and cystogenesis progress uh, along the tubules and the collecting duct in the medulla. And abnormal uh, fetal renal function is a frequent cause of oligohydramnios or anhydramnios, which is the common complications of the uh, Meckel-Gruber syndrome. Now, what happens in the Bactrel syndrome? Bactrel stands for vertebral defects, anal atresia, cardiac defects, tracheoesophageal fistula, renal anomalies, and the limb um, abnormalities. So, abnormal renal function is a frequent cause of oligohydramnios or anhydramnios in them. What happens in utero-placental insufficiency? Basically, um, utero-placental insufficiency results in decreased lycor volume because it causes the blood flow to redistribute to the fetal brain rather than abdomen and kidneys and that causes the poor urine output resulting in oligohydramnios. Coming to the infectious causes of oligohydramnios, congenital uh, viral infections like CMV causes oligohydramnios. And what are the reasons for oligohydramnios in infection? Basically, different studies have proposed um, a different mechanism, but uh, most of the studies say that the microbial invasion of the amniotic fluid uh, by the fetal infection and the development of the fetal inflammatory response syndrome may lead to the uh, redistribution of the blood flow away from the fetal kidneys, and that results in decreased uh, fetal urinary output and oligohydramnios. Coming to the iatrogenic causes of oligohydramnios, AC inhibitors like enalapril, lisinopril and captopril are responsible for oligohydramnios and studies show that late uh, pregnancy usage of uh, AC inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers may cause a severe oligohydramnios due to fetal renal impairment. 
and affected new nates will often suffer from uh, fetal renal and respiratory failure and all, all these changes cause the alteration in the normal mechanism of amniotic fluid formation in the fetus. Now, why the prostaglandin synthesis inhibitors like endomethacin and ibuprofen causes the oligohydramnios? The mechanism by which the endomethacin and these prostaglandin synthesis inhibitors cause oligohydramnios um, is, is still uh, under study, but uh, it is proposed that the uh, these substances cause the reduced upper fin of the fetal kidney with subsequent decrease in the fetal urine production and the reduction in the perfine is thought to be caused by the suppression of the renal activity or vasoconstriction of the renal arteries i would like to come bismillahirrahmanirrahim we are going to discuss the methods to diagnose oligohydramnios now after taking proper history from the patient and doing appropriate examination, the next step in managing a case of oligohydramnios is the assessment of amniotic fluid by using different ultrasonographic measurements. In the top right corner of this video in the I button, you can find other videos related to oligohydramnios. So what ultrasonography measurements are used to assess the amount of amniotic fluid? Those measurements are done by using three methods. First of all, subjective assessment of amniotic fluid. Secondly, measurement of maximum vertical pool. Thirdly, measurement of amniotic fluid index. Let us discuss the subjective assessment of amniotic fluid estimation. By subjective assessment of amniotic fluid estimation, we mean amniotic fluid evaluation along with biometry measurements and placing uh, one into three categories normal oligohydramnios or polyhydramnios subjective ultrasonographic measurements of amniotic fluid volume may serve as a screening test for the experienced ultrasonographer but there are many inter and intra observer variations in this type of assessment that's why when a decreased or increased amount of amniotic fluid uh, volume is suspected, one may elect to use the amniotic fluid index for the confirmation of subjective impression. Let us discuss the maximum vertical pool assessment. This is also called the single deepest pocket, SDP. And when to measure MVP? In both singleton and twin pregnancies, it is measured at less than 24 weeks of gestation. And how to measure MVP or the maximum vertical pool? For that, we need to find the largest pocket of amniotic fluid free of cord and fetal parts. Measure the greatest dimension with the ultrasound transducer perpendicular to the uterus. And the normal value of maximum vertical pool is 2 to 8 cm. Let us discuss amniotic fluid index. This is used in singleton pregnancies at 24 weeks or more. And how to measure it? First of all, divide the uterus into four equal quadrants and measure the deepest vertical uh, pocket of fluid in each quadrant. Pocket should be free of cord or fetal parts. Add the four measurements together to get the amniotic fluid index. So let us talk about the measurements of amniotic fluid index. A normal AFI measures between 5 to 24 cm. And when AFI is less than 5 cm, that is called oligohydramnios. And when AFI is more than 24 cm, it is called polyhydramnios. Now, how to measure the amniotic fluid index? Step number one, divide the uterus into four quadrants, A, B, C, D. Step number two, measure the deepest vertical pocket of fluid in each quadrant. And step number three is add the four measurements together to get the amniotic fluid index. When the uh, amniotic fluid index lies in the range of 5 to 24 centimeters, that is normal. So here in this example, you can see that from the four quadrant, we have added up the values of the deepest vertical pools to get the uh, AFI. And here it is 12 centimeters. So this is in the normal range. Now there are some prerequisites for the amniotic fluid index assessment. First of all, the pocket should be free of cord and the fetal parts. Here in this picture, you can see the first one is wrong. There are some fetal parts or the cord. Uh, and in the second picture, you can see that this is just the amniotic fluid. So the second picture is the right one. The second prerequisite is that measure the pocket vertically. So in the first picture, you can see that uh, someone is taking the oblique view, which is wrong. And in the second picture, the vertical pocket is taken and that is the right one. 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. After discussing the causes, pathophysiology and investigations of choice in oligohydramnios, now we are going to discuss its management. In the top right corner of this video, you can find the links of videos related to oligohydramnios. In order to manage a case of oligohydramnios, the first step is patient's counseling. Okay, so we need to counsel the patient regarding the diagnosis and the possible fetal maternal complications. Second step, divide oligohydramnios into mild, moderate and severe types for further management. So, what is mild oligohydramnios? Mild oligohydramnios is the one in which AFI is 5 to 8 cm. In moderate oligohydramnios, the AFI is 2 to 5 cm. And when AFI is less than 2 cm, that is called severe oligohydramnios. So, what are the possible complications of oligohydramnios? We have certain maternal complications and certain fetal complications. The maternal complications include increased risk of induction of labor and the risk associated with that, which are failed IOL, instrumental vaginal delivery and cesarean section. What are the fetal complications? The possible fetal complications include the preterm delivery, intrauterine growth retardation, unexplained intrauterine death after 38 weeks of gestation. If the patient is diagnosed with mild oligohydramnios, which means the AFI between 5 to 8 cm, then we will go for conservative management. But along with the conservative management, we will call the patient for regular antenatal visits on weekly basis. And in each visit, we need to inquire about the fetal movements. We will do the uh, proper examination to check the liquor volume and fetal size. Also do obstetrical ultrasound and biophysical profile on weekly basis and do the growth scan after every two to three weeks. Next, we will advise the patient to drink plenty of water as it increases AFI by 2 to 4 cm. In fact, 2 to 2 liter per day of water intake in a week will increase AFI by 2 to 4 cm. So, intake of water is very important. Next, we will consider steroid cover. Injection steroid in the form of DAXA or beta methasone is given between 28 to 36 weeks of gestation for fetal lung maturity as there is increased risk of preterm delivery. In the presence of complications, we will consider early delivery. But in the absence of any added complications, pregnancy would be taken to term and induction of the labor would be planned at 38 weeks to prevent the unexplained intrauterine death after 38 weeks of gestation. So this is how we will manage a case of mild oligohydramnios. How to manage a case of moderate to severe oligohydramnios? By moderate oligohydramnios, we mean the AFI between 2 to 5 cm. And when AFI is less than 2 cm, that is called the severe oligohydramnios. In such cases, we will provide the same management as we did in the mild oligohydramnios, but patient needs to be admitted till delivery for inpatient fetal monitoring. So, the first step is patient's admission to the hospital. Secondly, propped up position. Then, we should consider analgesia if required. Then, daily FKCC, the fetal kick count chart for assessment of the fetal moments. Next, twice daily fetal heart sound auscultation. Next comes twice weekly by physical profile plus AFI. Next, the growth scans two to three weekly. Next comes the IV fluids. Like infusion ringer lactate drip of one liter is given IV once daily or BD. Next comes the role of steroid cover for fetal lungs maturity. And after 38 weeks of gestation, we should consider induction of the labor in such case. So that was all about the possible complications and the management of a case of oligohydramnios. I would like to complete my presentation with this quote. And that is, 
the difference between possible and impossible lies in a person's determination. Okay, thank you so much. Wish you best of luck. Allah Hafiz.